good evening this is the fourth part of a fourth chapter magnetism and moving charges and uh, the first topic that we have for today is torque acting on a current carrying loop okay so what we have here is a loop like this again i'm telling you it is a loop this portion is not there it's just a coil which is carrying current if you see i have drawn the current in the uh, clockwise direction and the loop i have called as pqrs the loop is a pqrs loop and it is carrying current in the clockwise direction please understand that this is hollow part we are just talking about a current carrying loop which is in the shape of a rectangle okay now here we are going to find out an expression for the torque acting torque obviously means this loop is going to be in rotational motion so we are going to find out the uh, torque acting on this rectangular loop now in the previous section i had taught you the force acting on a current carrying conductor given by the formula ilb sin theta where theta is the angle between the length of the conductor which is in the direction of current and the external magnetic field i hope you remember that otherwise please go back into that previous session and check current carrying conductor when it is placed in an external magnetic field will experience a force giving given by the fleming's left hand rule the magnitude of that force is ilb sin theta where theta is the angle between the length and the magnetic field length is in the direction of current and it's a cross product between the length and uh, uh, the magnetic field cross product as you know the resultant will be perpendicular to the plane containing l and b and given by the right hand screw rule so now this rectangular coil we have here pqrs which is carrying a current i in the clockwise direction we have placed it in an external magnetic field the north and the south we have a north pole here and a south pole here so that the magnetic field at all points will be from north to south in the same direction this conductor pq experiences a force uh, the magnetic field in this direction same everywhere you have magnetic field from north to south like this okay now we are going to consider each part of this uh, loop and write down an expression for the force experience let's let's first write down the force acting on this conductor pq which i am going to call as f1 which will be equal to we know ilb sin theta so here theta is the angle between the length of the conductor and the magnetic field length of the conductor i told you will be in the direction of current like this magnetic field is here so this angle i am going to take as 90 minus theta because if i take my conductor like this now my conductor is placed like this i told you the area vector area vector is always a vector that is perpendicular to the plane of the coil so if i take the breadth of the coil perpendicular and drawing here will be this which i call as the normal vector perpendicular to the plane of the coil so that is this is a breadth and uh, perpendicular to the breadth will be like this this one perpendicular to the breadth and that is why this 90 degree so this whole angle is 90 degree which is perpendicular to the breadth of the coil this angle is 90 so if this angle is 90 and this is theta then this has to be 90 minus theta so i hope you understood that if you have the breadth of the coil if i draw the perpendicular okay like this so that is a perpendicular that i have drawn to the breadth of the coil this whole angle is 90 if i take this angle as theta the remaining angle will be 90 minus theta so the theta angle is the angle between the area vector that is perpendicular to the breadth of the coil that means perpendicular to the area of the coil you know if it is perpendicular to the breadth of the coil then it will be perpendicular to the area of the coil that is the direction of the area vector this is the magnetic field so angle between the area vector and the magnetic field is theta angle between the magnetic field and the breadth of the coil will be the 90 minus theta so if i am going to write a expression for force here i l b sin theta current i length of the conductor is what i call the breadth of the conductor then the magnetic field b angle between the small b and the capital b which is going to be sin 90 minus theta now this is going to be i b b 
cos theta and will it will have a direction given by the left hand um, rule or Fleming's left hand or you can use cross product. If I am going to use cross product then you should know that this uh, force will be perpendicular to the plane containing the two vectors B and capital B. So this is small b, this is capital B. So if you see your coil is placed like this, okay, this is your coil and this is the breadth of the coil, this is the magnetic field. So you have here breadth of the coil and here you have the magnetic field like this, okay. So this is the plane containing, so we have this as the plane containing the uh, breadth of the coil and the capital B, this is the plane of the coil. So perpendicular to that would be, you can have a perpendicular like this or you can have a perpendicular in the downward direction. So since from, as we move from small b to capital B, we are moving in the anti-clockwise direction, small b to capital B in the anti-clockwise direction. Anti-clockwise direction would mean your force F1 is in the upward direction or outward direction, perpendicular like this, okay. Force is in the upward direction or outward direction. So that is force F1 given by IB capital B cos theta acting on this coil in the upward direction because from B to B you turn in the anticlockwise direction. Now let us look at this here. This force, the angle between length, length is here and this is the magnetic field and this angle is 90 degree. So the force that is going to act here which I call as F2 in the formula I L B sin theta I length of the conductor is L capital B sin 90 because angle between length and the magnetic field is 90 degree. That will be I L B because sin 90 is 1. And let us look at the direction. As you go from L to B, that is you are moving from L to B in this direction. L I told you is in the direction of current. So this is the current. So that is length vector. As I move to B, you are moving in the clockwise direction. So clockwise direction would mean that this is exerted, this is acted upon by an inward force. Because L and B, this is a plane of the coin. That means you have the plane of the coin. You have this as L and this as B and length and breadth together. This will be an inward force. So I mark it as an inward force like this. And that is given by ILB which I will say is inverse. Okay. Now I come to this one. Here angle between the length. The length is here and the breadth is here. So this angle is now going to be, see this we already know is 90 minus theta. How do we know that? Because angle between small b and capital B, angle between small b and capital B you know is 90 minus theta. So naturally this has to be 90 plus theta. Why? Because you know that this total angle is going to be what? 180. So if you add 90 plus theta plus 90 minus theta, you get 90 plus 90 which is 180. So this angle between capital B and the length of this conductor is 90 plus theta. So now I am going to write that force as F3 going to be I. Length of the conductor is the breadth of the coil B capital B sin 90 plus theta which is also going to be I B B cos theta. Let us look at the direction. So we have a coil here like this. This is the breadth of the coil. So your current is in this direction and the breadth of the magnetic field is in this direction. So you will see that the breadth of the coil is like this small b. Capital B is also like this. So the plane containing small b and capital B are in this horizontal plane. Breadth of the coil and magnetic field like this. So the two are in a horizontal plane like this. So the force vector which is a cross product between small b and capital B will be perpendicular to this plane. Perpendicular to this plane and let's say perpendicular could be upwards or downwards. Let's check. 
So we have this from small b. This is the length of the conductor. So L cross B. So as we turn from L to B, we are turning. This is the capital B. Okay. This is the magnetic field B. So as we turn from L to B, we are turning in the clockwise direction. And because of that, we see that F, this is F3, which is coming down. So this is in the same line of action, like this. Now let us look at this force here, which I am going to call as F4. You see angle between the length and the magnetic field is 90 degree. So we have I, the conductor length is L, capital B, sin 90, which is I L B again because sin 90 is 1. Let us look at the direction here. As we move from length to magnetic field, we are moving in the anti clockwise direction. So I will put a dot here showing you that it is an outward force like this. So here we have an inward force, here we have an outward force perpendicular to the plane containing L and B. Okay, so this is an outward force. Now I hope you have understood that if you have your conductor, the, the loop, the current carrying loop like this, you have F1 which is equal to IBB cos theta pulling it up like this. F1 is upwards. And you have F3 here down. That is also same. IBB cos theta that is pulling it down like this. So on the same loop, you have one force pushing it up. And the other force pulling it down, both equal to I small b capital B cos theta because of which they will cancel each other and the net force of F1 and F3 on the loop will be 0. But on the other hand, you will see that F2 which is ILB, the maximum force here, it is an inward force. That means it is pushing this inwards like this, inwards. And you have F4 which is an outward force pushing it out. That is pushing it out with ILB. So you will see there is one force pushing it in. This is pulling it out. And you will see now it will experience a torque which will turn the loop in the magnetic field like this. Okay. So once more I will repeat. We have F1 and F3 both equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. And therefore the net force F1 and F3 will cancel. But you have F2 which is an inward force. This is, it is pushing it in like this. And F4 which is pushing it out like this. So it will turn in the magnetic field. And this force F2 and F3, F4 both are same. Acting on this producing rotational motion. So these forces are called a couple. So because of the couple this coil will start rotating in this magnetic field. And we are now going to find out an expression for that torque. In 11th standard, you have learned that the torque due to a couple is equal to any one of the forces multiplied by the perpendicular distance between the two forces. This we have done in 11th standard in rotational motion. So, torque due to a couple is equal to any one of the forces uh, that constitute the couple. The two forces are F2 and F3. So you have F2 here and F4 here. So the two forces that constitute the couple, F2 and F4, both are equal to ILB. So I may write F2 or F4 multiplied by perpendicular distance between F2 and F4. This is the formula for torque due to a couple. Now perpendicular distance between F2 and F4, that is this distance here. That I may draw as this, right? So let me call this as Tp. That is, this is the perpendicular distance between F2 and F4, here. So I need to find out this distance to substitute here. So tau is equal to F2 as I know is ILB that we already derived. Now, this perpendicular distance, you know that this is 90 minus theta. So, this is also what? 90 minus theta because they are alternate angles. So, if this is 90 minus theta, this also has to be 90 minus theta. This we already have as a 90. So, this angle should be theta. Agree? Because 
this is 90 minus theta alternate angle. So if this is 90 minus theta, this is 90 minus theta plus 90 plus theta will give you the 180. Now from this triangle, what can I write? From this triangle here, what is sine theta? From this triangle, sine theta is opposite side. That is Tp by the hypotenuse which is the breadth of the coil B. So that the perpendicular distance Tp. This is what we want as perpendicular distance between the two forces. Tp is equal to B into sine theta. That's what I substitute here. Perpendicular distance between F2 and F4 which is this Tp that I am calling will be B sine theta. Now, what is length into breadth of the coil? Length into breadth of the coil is the area of the coil. So, tau is equal to I A capital B sine theta. So, this is if it has, let's say, if it is one turn. Suppose this coil has n turns of wire or current carrying coil wound over it. Then, if there are n turns, it will be N I A B sin theta. Again, as I told you earlier, sin theta tells you that the torque is a vector product of two vectors here. The vectors here are the area vector and the um, magnetic field. Area vector we know is this one. So, this I will call as the area vector because I have told you area vector is always normal to the plane of the coil. So, angle between the area vector and magnetic field is what we have as theta. So, this is a cross product between the area vector and the magnetic field. Now, we are going to take this Nia as magnetic dipole moment M. So, tau is now going to be equal to Mb sine theta, which means tau is the vector product of M cross B. Now, you will see that this final answer is very, uh, is analogous to Tau equal to P cross Z, which I taught you in the first chapter, which is a torque acting on a dipole. Tau equal to P cross Z, where P is the electric dipole moment, which is equal to Q into 2A. Any one of the charges into the distance between the two charges. Here, Tau equal to F cross B. So, E has been replaced by the magnetic field. P, the electric dipole moment, has been replaced by the magnetic dipole moment. Let's see what is this magnetic dipole moment. Magnetic dipole moment is n into i into a where n is the number of turns on the coil. i is the current through the coil and a is the area of the coil. So the product of these three will be defined as the magnetic dipole moment. Okay. Now magnetic dipole moment obviously must have a direction. Electric dipole moment as you know is always directed from negative to positive. Same way here, if you take magnetic dipole moment M, which is N I A, this N is just a number, I scalar, area vector direction will give you the direction of magnetic dipole moment. So this area vector which we have taken, which is normal to the plane of the coil, will give you the direction of magnetic dipole moment. So let me show you once more, if this is your coil, you know that the current here I have shown in the clockwise direction. So, the area vector has to be perpendicular to this coil. Perpendicular and inwards because it is clockwise current. And right hand thumb rule. Right hand thumb rule for magnetic field. Same thing. If I have anti-clockwise direction of the current, then the magnetic dipole moment will be perpendicular to the plane of the coil and outwards. If the direction of current is in the clockwise direction, then the area vector and therefore the magnetic dipole moment will be perpendicular to the plane of the coil and inward. So the area vector determines the direction of magnetic dipole moment. What, are the, what about its SI unit? N has no SI unit. I, the SI unit of current is ampere. Area is in meter square. So the SI unit of, I think you can't see that. So the area, current I is in amperes. Area is in meter square. So the SI unit of magnetic dipole moment is ampere meter square. So I hope you all know all about this magnetic dipole moment. Magnetic dipole moment is this NIA where N is the number of turns of this coil. I is a current through the coil. 
A is the area of the coil. And uh, because you have N and I as scalar quantities, the magnetic dipole moment will have the same direction as area vector, which means if you have a coil like this, the area vector is always perpendicular to the coil. That means magnetic dipole is always perpendicular to the coil. If it is carrying clockwise direction current, like in this case, it will be perpendicular and inward. If it is carrying anti-clockwise current, then it will be perpendicular and outward. This is the direction of the magnetic dipole moment. It is a unit is ampere meter square. Now, because this, you will see that tau equal to m cross b, very similar to tau equal to p cross e. So, what is this magnetic dipole in this case? This current carrying coil acts as the magnetic dipole. Why magnetic dipole? Dipole means it has a north pole and a south pole. We already know that this coil which carries current has a north pole and a south pole. It has a magnetic field of its own. So, it will behave as a magnetic dipole. Okay. So, this is the derivation we have. This is um, torque acting on a current carrying loop when it is placed in an external magnetic field not its own magnetic field you know that a current carrying loop has its own magnetic field we did by our law first uh, derivation a circular coil which is carrying current remember it has its own magnetic field given by the right hand thumb rule here we are placing this mag uh, current carrying loop in an external magnetic field that's important in an external magnetic field. So, the B that we have marked here is an external magnetic field. I have kept a north pole and a south pole. So, we have a magnetic field like this. Okay. The coils loop, the loop has its own magnetic field given by the right hand thumb rule. Okay. We have our next and last topic which is the moving coil galvanometer. The last topic in this chapter is moving coil galvanometer. <coughs> okay, moving coil galvanometer. Now this moving coil galvanometer, you know a galvanometer is used to detect if there is current in a circuit. If there is current in a circuit, it will show deflection. Otherwise the needle, if there is no current, then the needle will be at the zero mark. Okay, in the moving coil galvanometer, we have an external magnetic field provided by two magnets which are having curved ends like this. Like this, okay. So instead of having a north pole like this and a south pole like this, we have curved the ends of the magnet here, north here, and this is also curved and this is south. And why we have done this is because it provides a radial magnetic field. As we go further, I'll explain what is the importance of having what you call as a radial magnetic field. Radial magnetic field. Radial magnetic field. Okay. Now I am going to place, so inside this magnetic field here, I am going to place a um, rectangular coil. Okay. Now this rectangular coil has, so this is how it is going to be. Now listen, so what you are seeing here, this circle here that you see is actually a core, a soft iron core. It is a cylindrical core. So you have a cylindrical core made of soft iron and it is kept like this. So when you look from there, you are only going to see the circular cross section of a core soft iron that is going in like this. So when you look from that side, you will see just the circle. And that is a circle that you see here. 
So that, that is the core which is going in like this. Then all around this core, you have a rectangular loop. That means you have a rectangular loop like this and that is passing over this coil. So you have a rectangular loop around this cylindrical core. So when you look from there, you will only see the breadth of the coil. You're only going to see your loop is like this. You will only see the breadth of the coil when you look from there. The rest of the coil is into the board like this. So this line that I've drawn here, this line, when you see this line, this is the loop, the breadth of the loop. Okay. Now the radial magnetic field starting from north goes on to south. North to south field. Your field is like this. North to south. Why is it called a radial magnetic field? Because it passes through the radius of this uh, soft time core. Now to this loop that you have kept like this, you have placed connected a, to the spring, you have connected a needle. So we have a needle that can pass over a scale like this. Okay, first of all, let me tell you what happens here. Now, this is a rectangular loop which is kept inside an external magnetic field. So, in the previous section, I told you, if you put a current carrying loop inside an external magnetic field, it will experience a force, a rotating torque. It will experience a rotating torque called, given by the formula, NIAB sin theta. So, whenever you put a current carrying loop, Inside an external magnetic field, it will experience a torque given by NIAB sin theta. It will not experience any net force because as I told you, we had in the previous session, F1 and F3 will cancel each other. Net force is zero. We have F2 pushing it inwards and F4 pushing it outwards. But both are equal, ILB, and both are in opposite direction. So that also net force is zero. So this coil, this coil or loop will not experience any net force but will experience a net torque given by N cross B. N is NIA, B sin theta. Now the importance of, so this is called the rotating torque because it is the torque that rotates the coil inside the magnetic field like this. Your coil is now rotating inside the magnetic field like this. So this is called the rotating torque. Now theta why do we provide a radial magnetic field? That's what I'm going to explain now. See, theta will always be 90 if you give a radial magnetic field. Because, see look, if your coil is in this position, let's say this is the line that is representing the coil breadth. So suppose your coil is like this, your area vector as you know is perpendicular to the coil. So your area vector will now be perpendicular to this magnetic field line. So, this theta is the angle between the area vector and the magnetic field. So, in this case, the magnetic field and the area are perpendicular to each other, which will be sin 90. Now, if your coil turns and let's say takes this position, it is in this position now, then the area vector is like this. When the area vector is like this, you will see that this magnetic field line is perpendicular to the area vector. So, then also it is 90. Suppose from this position it turns and takes a new position like this. So your area vector has also turned. So your area vector now will be perpendicular to this radial field line. This magnetic field line. And so you will see that magnetic field and area vector in this position is also equal to 90. So the reason why we provide a radial magnetic field is as your coil turns in this direction, the area vector also keeps changing because your area vector is perpendicular to the coil. So your area vector also will keep changing its direction. But in every position you will see that there is a magnetic field line perpendicular to the area vector maintaining theta to be 90 always and therefore torque will always be maximum. Sin 90 is 1. Let me show you. Suppose we had not curved the ends. Let's say this is like this. So we have north here and south here. Your magnetic field lines are always in straight lines. So now what will happen is, if I, if your coil was in this position, this is the area vector, perpendicular to magnetic field. Fine. But suppose your coil turns, your area vector also turns. 
Now if you see, your area vector is not going to be perpendicular to the magnetic field. So that is the importance of a radial magnetic field because even if your coil turns and the area vector turns along with the coil as at every position. In this position, you have this magnetic field perpendicular to the area vector. If it turns and the area vector comes in this position, this magnetic field is perpendicular to the area vector. Here, this magnetic field line is perpendicular to the area vector. So, you have magnetic field lines, radial magnetic field lines, providing always theta between area vector and magnetic field as 90 degree, giving you maximum rotating torque. Now, you will have a restoring torque given by K5. Now, for example, suppose you are sitting on a swing and let's say you turn yourself. The moment you let yourself be free, you will rotate back. You will keep rotating back. Why? Because there is a restoring torque bringing you back to the original position. Okay. Now, you will see that while you are rotating yourself, suppose you take more number of turns, then the restoring torque is larger. If you take one turn and if you take 100 turns, you can imagine the restoring torque will be larger for greater the angle. Which means your restoring torque is directly proportional to the angle through which you have turned. So this is equal to a constant K into phi where K you define as tau by phi, right? Tau by phi, which is, this is called the torsional constant which is the restoring torque per unit twist. That is for unit angle of turn, what is the restoring torque developed in that spring is what you call as the K, torsional constant. It will depend on the material of the spring that you have used. Okay. So, this is rotational torsional constant. So, your coil now is acted upon by two torque. One, the rotating torque, which is rotating it in the magnetic field. The other one is the restoring torque, which is trying to bring it back to its original position. Now, when your needle, which is attached to the coil like this, becomes, uh, comes into equilibrium, it means that this rotating torque and the restoring torque are equal. That is when your coil will come and rest in equilibrium like this. If your coil is in equilibrium, that is your needle is at rest, it means that the two torques acting on your coil are equal and opposite. So, in equilibrium, what will happen is, in equilibrium, the restoring torque, that is, K phi, should be equal to the rotating torque NIAB. Or you may write, uh, phi equal to NAB by K into I. This N is the number of turns. A is the area of the coil. B is the magnetic field that you have applied. K is a torsional constant. So this cons this is a constant. So you may write phi is proportional to the current. That means as you pass current through your coil, your coil will now show some deflection which is proportional to the current in the coil. So if there is no current in the coil, then, then, then there is no deflection. Your galvanometer needle will rest at zero. If there is a current in the coil, then depending on the current in the coil, the deflection will be proportional to that. Your coil will rotate and your magnetic, the needle will also move on the scale and the deflection, the twist, the angle of deflection will be directly proportional to the current in the coil. Now, to make your coil, your galvanometer highly sensitive, it means that even if the current is very small, you must have a large deflection because even if you are passing very small current through your galvanometer, it should be showing, the needle should be able to deflect showing you that there is current. Then you would call your galvanometer to be highly sensitive. Suppose you pass very small current and the deflection is extremely small, not even noticeable, then your galvanometer is not really sensitive. So if your galvanometer is highly sensitive, it means that even for small currents, you must have the needle showing large deflections. For this to be large, this NAB by K must be large. So that even if this is small, if this ratio is large, then you will have a large deflection. 
So to make your gabblometer highly sensitive, you can increase the number of turns. You won't increase the area because then your galvanometer will become too bulky. So you can increase the number of turns. You can increase the magnetic field B and that is why initially I told you we have a soft iron core. The soft iron core has high permeability and therefore will produce a large magnetic field B. Then you must take the material of the spring uh, with very low torsional constant. So if K is low, you have this NAB by K is large. So you must select the material uh, for the spring with a low torsional constant. And um, so that is how you can make your moving coil galvanometer highly sensitive. So this is uh, moving coil galvanometer. Uh, you can also convert your galvanometer to an ammeter and a voltmeter. So if you want to use, now the problem with using a galvanometer directly without converting it into an ammeter. Suppose you want to recurrent. I told you galvanometers are only used to detect if there is current in a circuit. Now suppose you want to measure the value of current in the circuit. Okay. Let's see what will happen. Suppose you want, you let's say we have a resistor connected to a cell. Let's say this is 3 volt. This is 3 ohm, then obviously the current is going to be equal to 1 ampere. Now you want to measure the amount of current in the circuit. To measure current, you have to connect the device in series. Why? Because only if you connect it in series, will the same current pass through the device also. So whenever you want to connect an emitter, which is the device or, uh, which uh, reads current or measures current, you connect it in series because only then the whole current will pass through that device. So now let us imagine your galvanometer. You didn't convert to ammeter. You just directly connected it as a galvanometer. So your galvanometer naturally will have large resistance. Why? Because uh, I told you to make your galvanometer sensitive. You will use large number of turns. You know resistance is directly proportional to length. So when you increase the number of turns, you are increasing the length and therefore galvanometers have large resistance. In our example, let us say your galvanometer has 97 ohm. So you are supposed to read what? 1 ampere current. To read that 1 ampere current, you connected a galvanometer whose resistance is 97 ohm. Now what has happened to the total resistance here? In series, the effective resistance will become 97 plus 3 will be 100. So the current in the circuit will reduce to I equal to V by R. Voltage was 3 but 3 plus 97 became 100 and you are now going to read what? 3 by 100 is 0 0.03 ampere. So what were you supposed to read? You were supposed to read this 1 ampere current. For that you connected the galvanometer. But because the galvanometer has high resistance you are reading the current to be 0 0.03 ampere, which is not true. You were supposed to read 1 ampere current. Your problem is the device, measuring device has high resistance. So you are reading wrong current. So ideally, your galvanometer should have had zero resistance. Ideal. Ideal ammeters must have zero resistance. In which case, when you connect the measuring device, that's the ammeter, the total resistance still remains to be 3 plus 0 will be 3 itself. And you will read your 1 ampere current which is now passing through the ammeter also 1 ampere current. So ideally your ammeter which is the measuring device must have 0 resistance. So if you want to use your galvanometer as an ammeter, you cannot directly use it as such because it has high resistance. So you must do something to it so that you bring its resistance down ideally to zero. So what you can do is you take your galvanometer. In our example, we said it's just an example, okay? We said it is 97 ohm. Now you want to reduce the galvanometer's resistance ideally to zero. Not possible, but we can bring it down. Now if you have two resistors and you connect it in series, the effective resistance will be added up and it will be greater than the bo both the resistors, right? Because resistance in series is R1 plus R2. So, it, this RS will be greater than R1 and greater than R2. 
Suppose you connect two resistors in parallel. This is 1 by R1 plus 1 by R2. So this RP will always be lesser than or equal to the smaller one. For example, let's say R1 is, R1 is smaller than R2. Then RP will be lesser than or equal to the smallest one, R1, when you calculate. So, when you want to reduce the resistance of your galvanometer, all you have to do is connect in parallel another resistance. For example, let me say I connected a 0 0.010. Okay. This is called as the shunt resistance. So, I give it a name shunt resistance S. A resistance connected in parallel to the galvanometer is called a shunt resistance. Now, if you find the effective resistance of this, which is 1 by RP equal to 1 by 97 plus 1 by 0 0.01, you will see RP will always be less than or equal to this 0 0.01. It will be less than or equal to 0 0.01. So, what have we done? Effectively, we have reduced the resistance of this whole arrangement to something equal to or less than this 0 0.01. This whole thing together is what you call as an ammeter. Your galvanometer connected in parallel to a shunt resistance is what you call as an ammeter. So now if you go and connect this to our previous circuit, we have the 3 ohm here, we had the 3 volt battery here and you were supposed to read that 1 ampere current. We converted the galvanometer to an ammeter by connecting a shunt resistance and let's imagine the effective resistance is less, it will be less than or equal to this. Let's imagine it is equal to 0 0.01. I haven't calculated it. So, your ammeter is going to be having a resistance of 0 0.010. Okay. Now, what is the effect in here? 3.01. So, the current I am going to read is going to be 3 by 3.01, which will be almost equal to 0 0.99, which is very close to the actual value that you have supposed to read, very close to 1 ampere. So, by converting a galvanometer to an ammeter, you simply mean you are reducing the resistance of the galvanometer by connecting a very small shunt resistance in parallel to it so that the effective resistance is ideally close to zero, very small values. Okay. Now, how do you calculate what you must connect here? What is the shunt resistance to be connected? That's what I am going to show you. So, this is whole thing called as the ammeter. So, in your main circuit, which you had that main circuit, the main current is I. You are going to read that current. Let's say current IG has entered through the galvanometer. So, by Kirchhoff's rule, the remaining current I minus IG must pass through this branch. So, that the sum of the currents leaving IG plus I minus IG is equal to I will be equal to the current that is entering the galvanometer, uh, entering this uh, parallel connection. Now, since these two are in parallel, they must have the same voltage. So, voltage across the galvanometer must be equal to voltage across the shunt. Voltage across galvanometer will be I into R, which is the current through this is IG. The resistance of the galvanometer is G equal to the voltage across this will be the current here is I minus IG into the resistance of that is the shunt resistance S. So, you get the formula S is equal to IgG by I minus IG. That means if you want to calculate what is the shunt that should be connected to read a particular current, this is the formula where IG is the current through the galvanometer, G is the resistance of the galvanometer, I is the maximum current that you may read using that ammeter. For example, Suppose I tell you, uh, how do you convert a galvanometer to an ammeter to read from 0 to 6 ampere. So, the maximum current that must be read by the ammeter is 6. So, that is what is, we are going to substitute here, the maximum current. And you calculate the shunt value. Put that in parallel to your galvanometer. You would have converted your galvanometer to an ammeter that can read up to 6 ampere current. That can read up to a current of I amperes. Okay. Now, we also need to know how you can use or convert your galvanometer to a voltmeter to measure the potential difference. So, now, in the same circuit before, 
suppose we have this circuit here with the 3 volt battery and the 3 ohm it's carrying 1 ampere current. Now across this the voltage is what? Across this vo the voltage is V equal to I into R. So this is I into R. This 3 volt will appear here. I need to measure that 3 volt. So if I am going to go and connect the galvanometer. Okay. With 97. Now what this 1 ampere will do is. When it reaches this junction. It will split into 2. Some current will go here. Remaining current only is going to come here. So what will happen is. Now if you find the voltage across this parallel connection. It will be less than this 3 volt. The galvanometer will carry some part of the current. This is carrying the remaining part of the current. Right. So what will happen is. The current through this resistance has decreased. So I into R means the voltage also will be lesser. Because you have taken away part of the current. So ideally what should happen is. The full 1 ampere current must pass through this. This galvanometer should not take up any current. So ideally this if you are going to convert using your galvanometer as a voltmeter. This should have a resistance which is equal to infinity. So that this branch does not take up hardly any current. The full 1 ampere current will go into the main circuit. Okay. So what are you trying to do when you convert your galvanometer to a voltmeter? You are going to increase the resistance close to very high values. So that your voltmeter has high resistance. And it will not take up much of the current from the main circuit. The main current I 1 ampere will go through the 3 ohm giving you the 3 volt. Okay. So now we have. Uh, so suppose you want to convert your galvanometer to a voltmeter. Mm -hmm. So you have your galvanometer to voltmeter. Let's say this was our 97 ohm. So you want the effective resistance to increase. If you want your effective resistance to increase, you should connect another resistance in series to this. So that the effective will get added up. So for example, suppose you go and connect a higher resistance. Let's say R equal to 10,000. So you will now get an effective resistance of 10,097. You have increased the resistance to a large value. So how do you convert a, resist a galvanometer to a voltmeter? By simply connecting a high resistance in series to the galvanometer. Then you would have converted that to a voltmeter. Now let us see what is the value of resistance that you must connect to convert your galvanometer to read a particular voltage. Okay. So if I say this is a current IG through the galvanometer. Same current IG must go through this resistance also because it is in series. Now let us say the total voltage is V. If the total voltage is V, the voltage across the galvanometer is Vg and the voltage across the resistance I call as Vr. The total voltage will be V equal to Vg plus Vr or V is equal to what is Vg? Ig into G plus what is Vr? Ig into R. Right? So if I bring the common Ig to the left hand side. Then I may write V by IG is equal to G plus R or R is equal to V by IG minus G. V by, so this is IG G plus IG into R or this is equal to IG into G plus R which is equal to V. Or V by IG is G plus R. Or the resistance R is equal to V by IG minus G. What is this V? It is a max. Suppose I tell you. Convert your galvanometer to a voltmeter. That can read up to 6 volt. So the maximum voltage that your voltmeter can read is this V. Divided by IG which is a current through the galvanometer. And which is a current through the resistance. This G is the resistance of your galvanometer. So this, pump, this whole thing that is your galvanometer connected in series to a high resistance is what you would use as a voltmeter. So that is the end of this chapter. It's a long chapter and the, today what we discussed is we started with deriving an expression for torque which is acting on a rectangular loop that is carrying current. Also please remember this rectangular loop is kept in an external magnetic field. 
it does not have to be rectangular. You can use it for any shape because in your final formula, tau equal to ni ab sin theta, we are only interested in the area of the loop, not the shape of the loop. So it could be rectangular, it could be circular, it could be any other shape. Um, tau acting on a loop carrying current placed inside an external magnetic field given by tau equal to n cross b. And uh, then we went on to moving coil galvanometer. And last, how do you convert a galvanometer to an ammeter which can read current? And how can you convert a galvanometer to a voltmeter to read the voltage or potential difference? Okay, thank you.